Ancient Greece is arguably the foundation of our entire world, at least the Western world to a great extent. This video will be divided into four main parts, and feel free to jump between segments of this video. Who were the Greeks? The Greeks were people living in ancient Greece. But fundamentally, being a Greek was demarcated by a certain way of life, and not just the lineage. Ethnically and culturally, the people we call the Greeks originally had a diverse background. The three main tribes were the Dorians, Ionians, and Aeolians. However, Around the end of 8th century BC, we can see a common thread and a way of life among these different groups of people around the southern Balkans. The Greek way of life can be understood by the following three aspects, cultural practices, language, and religion. One famous cultural practice, or a festival, is the Olympian Games, which is believed to have started in 776 BC and held over four years, just like modern Olympics are. In addition to shared festivals, the Greek language was very important for the development of the Greeks' way of life as it allowed things such as the formal inscription of traditional oral poetry. As we learned previously, the Greeks owe a lot to the Phoenicians as the Greek language was an adaptation of the Phoenician script. Fun fact, interestingly, the Greeks refer to themselves as the Hellenes and not the Greeks. The Romans named them the Greeks. Also, the origin of the word barbaric comes from ancient Greece. Barbaros, which meant non-Greek speaking. Finally, Greek religion was very important. Maybe the most important, since it imbued all aspects of Greek life. We need to first bear in mind that the Greeks were all over the Mediterranean. It naturally follows that for a long time, the Greek pantheon of gods wasn't coherent. However, Greek mythology becomes and became coherent when a man named Homer wrote the Iliad and Odyssey. Now, we don't really know if Homer was an actual person or not. Regardless, it is believed that the books came together in 700 BC in Ionia, a place located in Asia Minor. These two books are very important since they are the bedrock of Western literature together with the later Bible. Something else important to know regarding Greek mythology and their way of life is that they embraced the mysterious world. They believed in omens and oracles as practiced in the shrines of Apollo in Delphi. The implication is that they embraced some sort of irrationality, the unexplainable. This may come as a surprise since most people believe the Greeks were super rational throughout history, but in fact, this hyper rationality only emerges in the later classical era. I want to mention something interesting here as well. Greek mythology is believed to include imported ideas from Egypt and Asia. And by Asia, I mean places such as India. We can see this in the way the Greek gods are remarkably human as in the case of Egypt, and the idea of the different ages of man is probably from ancient India. So this goes on to show the influence that the Persian Empire had. Now, you may be wondering, how did the Greeks, or the Greek way of life, appear when the Greeks were widely spread across the Mediterranean? Well, 
their way of life must have been cultivated through continuous exchanges of thought, right? And the Greeks settled near the coasts, which must have facilitated the exchange of ideas and the development of a shared culture. Now, what factors contributed even to the Greeks settling near the coasts? Well, there must be a few reasons, but I think the key reason is geographical. Because Greece has lots of valleys, 80% of Greece is mountainous, so as you can imagine, it's hard to communicate between valleys. Thankfully, they had the Aegean Sea, and traveling on water was way faster and efficient than on foot. In addition, locations near water tend to have better soil, which must have encouraged the Greeks to settle near the coast. Next, I'll be talking about Greek social and political institutions. The social hierarchy of Greece can be generally divided into four levels. The aristocrats, citizens, foreign residents, and slaves. Almost all the Greek cities were ruled by aristocrats, not by monarchs. To briefly explain, aristocracy is a system in which a city is ruled by a few people, whereas a monarchy is generally ruled by one. Now, what does this mean? At least on the macro scale of entire Greek, it meant that the Greeks didn't have a unifying system, which also explains why they didn't have an enduring empire. Aristocrats were typically born into wealthy families who owned large amounts of land and held political power. Below the aristocrats were the freemen, citizens of Greece. These people usually owned land too. In ancient Greece, wealth was pretty much contingent on land owning, so wealth didn't really transfer to people. Besides the aristocrats were the metics, the foreign residents. These people did not have civic privilege, and here's an interesting fact. The Greeks saw commerce and menial tasks as below themselves, so they delegated these to the metics. Already, you can see the Greeks forming a hierarchy of valuable and meaningful work. The Greeks also had slaves, although there are some uncertainties regarding the institution. It is estimated that one-fourth of Athenian population were slaves, and it seems like most slaves were women. As I hinted at earlier in this video, trade was a cornerstone of ancient Greece. They had a sophisticated trading community in which they would trade with places even such as Egypt, and trade ultimately allowed people to specialize on one craft. Just like in today's world, we see a lot of specialists instead of generalists. This meant that the ownership of land stopped being the key metric to measure status. And we start seeing a change not only in the social arena, but the political as well. Land stopped being the pure source of status, right? And one of those which newly counted towards status was the ownership of an army. Not merely owning any army, but a tactical and disciplined army. Why might this be the case? Well, honestly, I don't really know, but I presume something like the following. At first, the ownership of land was the measure of status. Why? Well, you could be self-subsistent, and the size of land became the physical and concrete metric for status. The size of property was equated to wealth, and people didn't mind flaunting their wealth since no one can physically steal land. However, with commerce, now we don't really need much land to be self-subsistent, so this premium 
on land and dwindled. You can't display your silver coins because people can steal now, right? So what's the next metric for status? Well, if you read Greek mythology, you can tell the Greeks had great reverence for military prowess in the form of single combat. Hence, the army, being the scaled version of military prowess, became one of the key metrics for status. This is all just my presumption, so if anyone knows why the army became a source of social status for the Greeks, please comment and educate me. Regardless, the reason I try to explicate this is because we see a change in the social consciousness of the ancient Greeks with the invention of money, or at least the circulation of money. The original Greek ideal of warfare was single combat prowess. However, with the expansion of commerce, it seems like the Greek ideal somewhat shifts towards having a disciplined and tactical army. And I believe this is reflected in places such as the famous Sparta, where they had great organized armies. Interestingly, this idea of a disciplined and cohesive army influences the political arena of Greece. But before explaining it further, I'll briefly explain how Greek city-states were organized. As mentioned earlier in this video, Greek communities were originally organized as small, independent tribes or villages. Over time, these tribes and villages grew and merged into larger political entities, eventually leading to the formation of city-states, which is a city that governs itself, hence called the city-state. To put its scale into perspective, most Greek city-states had the size of a either a modern-day village or a town. The Greeks invented politics, which is the idea of publicly discussing collective concerns of the city. In fact, the English word politics is derived from the Greek word polis, which means city-state. This Greek polis was and became the framework of pretty much all Greek life. What this meant is that everyone in the city, more or less, knew each other, and it was expected that all inhabitants had shared interests and goals. If your interests or goals didn't align with that of the city-state, you were more than welcome to move to a different city-state. This idea of the polis, the city-state, is actually rooted in the previously mentioned Greek ideal of a disciplined and cohesive army. The citizens of the city-state were expected to be cohesive, which, as you can imagine, comes with social political stability, but also a narrowed world view. This in turn meant that Greece would be a very hard region to unify, since each polis, each city-state, had a strong sense of self. The city-states were governed by all its citizens, and there was no bureaucracy. This effectively meant that pretty much all citizens could fit in a large room. But again, bear in mind that to be a citizen, you had to pretty much own land and be rich. You probably have heard of Athens and Sparta. Those are just two city-states of ancient Greece out of about 150. Actually, we don't really know the exact number of city-states that existed, but no, there was a lot. So, as you can imagine, each city-state faced a problem of its own. However, a general story, a narrative of Greek political transformation can be formed. I said that ancient city-states were ruled by the aristocrats, right? However, around 7th century BC, we see a rise of tyrants. Now, for the Greeks, the word tyrant did not have the negative connotation that it has today, and it just referred to a ruler without traditional authorities, namely the aristocrats. 
These tyrants were usually popular from the inhabitants of the city-states, since there was a rising concern towards the aristocracy. However, the time of the tyrants was short-lived, and by the 6th century, there was a turn towards collective government in the forms of oligarchies, a system of being ruled by a few people, constitutional government, a form of government in which the powers and responsibilities of the government are defined and limited by a written constitution, and finally, early forms of democracies. In a rather short time span of a few hundred years, the Greeks experienced four types of political structures. Monarchy, oligarchy, tyrant, and democracy. Athens was one of the city-states that underwent these changes and became the most democratic cities in ancient Greece. Although, ironically, Athens is believed to have had the most slaves in ancient Greece. One great differentiation between Athens and other cities is that Athens started to foster festivals and cults that was accepting of all Greeks, not just Athenians. As I said earlier, each city-state had a strong sense of self, so this was quite revolutionary. While Athens dealt with the political unrest with democracy, Sparta, on the other hand, used a conservative and traditional approach, focusing on military training and a strict social hierarchy. Unlike Athens, Sparta never had any tyrants, and their state was mainly ruled by aristocrats whose origin come from the hoplites, the warriors. This meant that the Spartans focused on strict discipline from an early age. Referring back to Homeric values, Spartans also disregarded commerce and actively disallowed a commercial class to appear. The demographic of ancient Sparta was mostly non-citizens. Most were helots, basically a slave. The citizens of Sparta relied on the helots for food production. Although the citizens had a lot of power, they were also afraid of the helots, the slaves, revolting. Some background information is important to understand this. Basically, the Spartan citizens were believed to be of Dorian descent, who are the tribes that invaded southwest Greece back in around 12th century BC. The Helots, the slaves, are believed to be the original inhabitants of the region. This explains why the Spartans, the citizens, were in constant fear of internal revolts. This fear manifested itself in the Spartans keeping a large number of troops in the city. A lot of my information comes from this book called The Penguin History of the World, and you can check it out in my description box. I'll now talk about Greek history starting from the end of the Greek Dark Ages. The end of the Greek Dark Ages marked a significant transition in Greek history as the Greek city-states emerged from centuries of economic, social, and political instability to develop a new, more structured society. Eventually, the Greeks decided to colonize regions in their vicinity due to reasons such as overpopulation, socio-political unrest, and hunger. Some people didn't like the fact that the Greeks started colonizing and one of them were the Phoenicians. They tried to prevent them, but the Phoenicians were defeated in 480 BC. If you want to know more about this war, you should research the First Sicilian War. Out of all international troubles, the Persians were the worst. The war with the Persians is the inauguration, the start, of classical Greece. Starting with the war, the time period between 5th and 4th century BC 
was very formative for later Greek identity. So here's basically what happened between the Persians and the Greeks. Persia first conquers Lydia. Next, Persia goes to conquest Ionia. And after Ionia gets conquested, there's news that Persia failed to conquest Scythia, which probably encouraged the Ionians to revolt against the Persians. Some Greek cities, including Athens, decided to help the Ionians, but Persia won. This motivated the Persians to try to conquer Athens, which led to the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, but Athens was able to defend their land. Eventually, all the Greek city-states decided to team up and fight Persia, culminating in the final Battle of Salamis in 480 BC, where the Greeks were victorious. Persian forces left all Greek territory, including Ionia, and this was the height of Greek spirit and unison. During the Persian War, a Greek military alliance called the Delian League was formed in 478 BC, which Athens primarily led. Initially, the League was purely to go against Persia. However, Athens started to exploit the Delian League and the alliance devolved into a mechanism in which Athens demanded tribute from other cities. This continued even after the peace treaty with Persia in 449 BC. Unsurprisingly, many cities were unhappy with the exploitation, so some cities tried to go against Athens, and one of them was Sparta. Sparta formed the Spartan League and led the war against Athens in 460 and also in 431, which is called the Peloponnesian War. The Peloponnesian War lasted 21 years until 404 BC. The Spartan League basically surrounded Athens on land, but Athens had a superior navy. The first half of the war was quite sterile due to the Athenians staying on the shore and Spartans on land. Athens tried to conquer Sicily since it was a major trade center which provided the Spartan League many material supplies, but Athens was defeated, and this resulted in political upheaval back in Athens. On the other hand, Athenian loss unified the spirit of the Spartan League and they eventually decide to seek Persian help for more support. They get Persia to agree by saying that Persia can colonize the Asian side of Greek once again. This makes sense as Ionia was in the Delian League and Ionia used to be ruled by Persia. With the help of Persia, the Spartan League defeated Athens in 404 BC. The Peloponnesian War was so important, to the point many historians gave special attention to this part of history. Now why might this be the case although the scale of the war wasn't as spectacular? Well, this is because of the cultural and intellectual achievements the Greeks reached during the time of war, mainly in the 5th century BC. Before getting into the cultural and intellectual development and achievements of the Greeks, let's first learn a bit about some characteristics of classical Greek during this time. The economic system was pretty much the same as a barter economy, although money was invented. In general, women did not have as much rights as men. However, not all city-states were like this. For example, Athens did not allow women to own property, but Sparta did. It's said that it was conventional for high-class young males to have affairs with older males. We don't really see examples of homosexuality in same-aged 
males nor females, although we can't really rule out the possibility. Finally, it's important to understand that most of our knowledge comes from texts from Athens. Athens recorded a lot, and the subject would naturally be about the citizens, that is, the upper class. They all thought trade and industry weren't proper jobs, and it's interesting, right, to think about what was considered a real job throughout history. Since we know a lot about ancient Greece based on the Athenians, we need to be cautious about generalizing all of Greece to be like Athens. However, however, it is true that Athens was a central place in Greece and a place the Western world owes a lot to. Although a lot can be said about classical Athens, the single greatest achievement and contribution is the turn to rationality, specifically philosophy. Compared to her predecessors, Athens contributed the most to humanity's historical advancement, allowing mankind to consciously control the environment. Their philosophical intuitions and inquiries led to the idea that there was a logical, rational, and consistent, coherent order to the universe that would allow humans to explain the world. Remember, most were still fettered by the traditional superstitions and irrationalities of their time, although in their own minds, they were probably being rational. So now let's have a look at Greek philosophic genealogy. As I've said, philosophy owes a lot to Athens. However, all of Greek was crucial to the philosophical development in Greece. When talking about Greek philosophy, we need to understand that for them, philosophy included every inquiry. The idea of separating disciplines such as philosophy and science is only a modern system. With that in mind, I'll list some noteworthy figures and briefly outline their works, but please note that this is very introductory and not exhaustive. Philosophy starts in 6th century Ionia by Thales and Anaximander. Although their conclusionary remarks were erroneous, they used impersonal explanations to make sense of the world instead of relying on myths. And this is their key contribution. Interestingly, within the different schools of thought during their time, an atomic theory of the world appeared, which is quite surprising, right? But the explanation that the world consisted of four elements, water, air, fire, and earth, was the winner, and this theory shapes the West until the Renaissance. The next figure I want to mention is Pythagoras. Pythagoras his contribution to the Western world, aside from his Pythagorean theorem that contemporary schools still teach, is the value he placed on mathematics as being more fundamental to understanding the universe rather than observing the physical world. He advocated a deductive approach and made it mainstream. A deductive approach is basically a top-down process where we start with general statements and then apply them to specific cases. We'll soon see this deductive approach being contrasted with the inductive approach, a approach that modern science usually uses, by a man named Aristotle. The next monumental figures are Socrates and Plato. They are from 5th century Athens and arguably the most famous philosophers from Greece. They are usually bundled up and talked about simultaneously because their ideas are pretty much believed to be quite similar. And this is because Plato, being a student of Socrates, 
actually just wrote about Socrates, while Socrates never wrote anything. They believed that the physical world, for example, the body, was separated from the world of ideas or ideals, which could be conceived by the soul or rationality. This distinction between the soul and body would be a key theme in subsequent philosophical and religious thought. The idea of placing less importance on the physical world is likely influenced by Pythagoras. Now, Plato's colossal work, *The Republic*, is said to have asked all the important philosophical questions and discussed. All those matters, to the point that there's a saying that all subsequent Western philosophy is a footnote to Plato, although that's just an exaggeration. Also, the Republic, Plato's work, is said to be the first book on political philosophy, a book that discussed how to achieve an ethical city. Next comes Aristotle. He was a student of Plato, who is said to have attended Plato's school, the Academy, which is said to be the first university. Although Aristotle didn't necessarily disagree with Plato on most things, the key difference between Aristotle and Plato is that Aristotle used the inductive approach. He gave more value to experience and the physical world. An important facet of his philosophy is the concept of the mean, which basically said that based on all empirical data, it seems like excellence, and thus happiness, is achieved between two extremities. For example, courage is the mean between cowardice and Rashness. There was another figure who placed importance on empirical data, a man who is said to be the father of history. His name is Herodotus. He's from fifth century BC, and he wanted to understand the Persian War and about Persia, so he commenced a systematic review of events, thus starting history. History actually comes from the Greek word historia, meaning inquiry, to search, or ask for information. For those of you who find or found history boring, it may be because we've deviated from history's original purpose in a lot of schools. There was another important figure for history called Thucydides, who lived during the time of Herodotus. He wanted to understand and explain the Peloponnesian War because he thought there was practical value, meaning he believed history can teach us useful things. His final analysis was that the war was caused due to Athens' rising power and Sparta's rising fear, which goes on to show that he has some sociological intuitions as well. Next. I want to diverge a bit from philosophy and talk about Greek literature. All Greek literature starts from poetry, and has its roots in religious beliefs and moral teachings. Therefore, poets were considered teachers in ancient Greece, and this is reflected in the didactic theme present in much of Greek literature, including the famous tragedies. The Dithyram, considered one of the first dramas, was performed at the festivals of Dionysus, and is seen as the origin of Greek tragedy. These dramas allowed men to reflect on the social and moral dimensions of life in a way that was unique for the time. Later on, we see the development of two other dramatic forms in ancient Greece. Forming a total of three major dramatic forms: tragedy, satyr, and comedy. After the city-states disappeared in 146 BC, due to the Romans, Greek literature 
became a major influence throughout the world as Greek became the lingua franca of the Middle East. Greek culture also had a major impact on other forms of art, such as sculptures, monuments, and architecture. It is important to note that Greece had abundant resources, which may have contributed to its great artistic expressions. As we've learned, in just four centuries of ancient Greece, we see the invention of politics, philosophy, most of arithmetics and geometry, and many artistic forms that were to become the foundation of later Western thinking and art.